Good morning. Welcome to be this morning on Sunrise Daily. And of course, uh, before that break that we saw this uh, new ministry, obviously we're having different sides of uh, conversation on that new ministry, Ministry of Livestock expectations, uh, what does it do to the cost of governance, you know, and all of that. Uh, so many sides to it. I know it will be a continuing one. That's why you have to stay here on Channel Television because our various programs will touch on that. And more. But now let's, for just about 30 minutes, uh, do a bit of business, starting from the global space as usual. We start with oil prices, where on Wednesday we start the impact from hurricane to burial dissipated, uh, weak consumer demand and top crude importer, China. So it's moved from US now to China. That's the impact of it. Now let's look at uh, what the prices look like and we see that it's red, 0.69%. That's a huge uh, uh, drop right there. Uh, but you know, fears are also reducing when it comes to supply. So it's $84.08 a barrel for Brent. So that's uh, Nigerian's crude is, is from there. WTI, this for the United States is $80.93 and that's down 0.59%. A weather or uh, the uh, hurricane Beryl is a major contributor to that movement. And then oil and gas companies restarted some operations on Tuesday. Some ports uh, reopened and most producers and facilities were ramping up outputs, although some facilities sustained damage and power had not been fully restored. Uh, so that's it, uh, the impact of uh, hurricane burial affecting oil prices today. Still talking about oil now, but back here in Nigeria, the Nigerian National Petroleum Company Limited is in talks for another oil backed loan to strengthen its finances and support business investment. The chief executive officer of NNPC, Ms. Amelia Kieri, made this known in an interview with Reuters. The state-backed oil company aims to raise at least $2 billion as its debt to gasoline suppliers have doubled to $6 billion in the past four months. Mr. Kieri confirmed that the company seeks a loan against 30,000 to 35,000 barrels of oil per day crude production with the fund supporting overall business activities. Currently, NNPC has a $3.3 billion oil-backed loan through a Frexton Bank. However, rising fuel subsidy costs have strained its cash flow. So, I mean, first hearing this, obviously you think at this point we're having uh, refineries coming up in the country and we're looking for crude. And here we have even more strain on crude supply. What will this do to the country? Are we going to see a situation where, uh, well, a country that is supposed to be a giant in crude production, at least on the continent, is also importing crude? Well, these are worrying issues, concerns have been raised. And we'll discuss this uh, on Business Incorporated. So you want to join Laddie Williams at 1 p.m to see uh, some other perspective on this uh, request for a new loan from the NNPCL and its crude backed new loan. So you want to join us uh, by then. Then we look at the Naira where NAFEX uh, is still depreciating as uh, the close of trade on Tuesday. It closed at, for Knafem, it closed at 1,000. 532 Naira, 58 Kobo, uh, open at 1,523. There's a drop of 0.57%. Nafex also dropped, dropped 0.84%. That's even bigger. Uh, closed at 1,534 Naira, 51 Kobo. Yesterday, we had that conversation about our reserves gaining, but we haven't seen it trickle down to uh, the market yet, at least the value of the Naira. And now, I guess, yesterday, uh, Dr. Josh Banfo had said, there may be need for intervention, but we've not had quite intervention from the CBN into the market for more than three weeks now. Uh, you know, I wonder if that is necessary. I mean, we call that uh, maybe an artificial value when they intervene. So is it better for it to be like this? Uh, we will watch and see. Now, the youth wing of the All Progressive Congress is uh, organizing an empowerment program for skills acquisition. That program is still ongoing now. We had uh, the youth leader, APC youth leader, on the show last week, Friday, to tell us about this program, which has an attendant of stakeholders from the Bank of Industry, Smeden, and others. It's set to prepare attendees for doing business in Nigeria.
Being a ruling party is not just about winning elections, but empowering youth in the country beyond party lines. That's the focal point of this Enterprise Skills Development Training Program for 2024. While the insignia of the All Progressives Congress dots the venue, the event is open to all who is ready to get empowered. Do that for him. Thank you. The APC youth leader, Dr. Dio Israel, says this is part of the wing's four-year plan to contribute to the president Bola Tinubu's development drive. We want to turn our young people from job seekers to job creators. We want to build the capacity of everybody in this hall, not just youth, but even those who are youth at heart, to help them to see and move from just being a dreamer to, a rea to turn their dreams into reality. And that's what this training is about. The training begins with words to reorientate all present on the need to actively contribute to economic development. But ultimately, ultimately, no business, no company can ever pay you what you're worth. The best solution for any nation, as we all know, is the masses getting involved in business and feeding themselves, fending for themselves. And so today I would encourage you, whether or not you are in entrepreneurship um, or you are in a nine to five, please create value. Sometimes along the way you find a helper. Like we are here today, somebody might just impress me and we, have, we get chatting and he says, oh, bros, I have this proposal. If it looks good, yes. If you come to me for help, I tell people I don't just help. You want to set up a business, go and bring your business plan. You must plan. You must have a focus. There is no free lunch. Especially for those who work hard, they will not give you free lunch. Thank you. The program promises hands-on experience for all registered participants from July 8 to 12. Yeah, well, I guess uh, it's beyond just uh, politics uh, right there. But now, one of the things that could make that a frustration or a success is power. Uh, the federal government, I mean, we don't want to talk about uh, greed collapse. We know what happened over this weekend, this past weekend. The federal government has issued six licenses uh, in different firms for independent distribution of electricity in the country. And uh, according to uh, the Nigerian Electricity Regulatory Commission, it shows that an analysis of uh, the commission uh, regulator issued, the, according to that, the regulators explained that the networks were designed to independent of the in main transmission, that's the off-grid transmission, and operate a smaller scale, providing electricity to specific areas of communities. Well, we have someone who did not just get that license, uh, has been playing in that field, that's the independent power supply field, for a bit now. He joins us in the studio. He's the managing director of Welbeck Electricity Independent Power, Mr. Falabi Ayola. Thank you so much for your time, Mr. Thank Ayola, you. for your time. And um, so this is addition to, mm. you know, your operations. Yes. Maybe more competition and all of that, but I guess that's good sure. for consumers. But tell us how it's been like playing in the field as an independent power supplier in the country where there's a huge need for it and it does look like going on the grid uh, becomes even more challenging mm. every time. I think that we're in very interesting times here. Um, as you know, the federal government moved electricity generation, transmission and distribution from the executive list to the concurrent list. Um, and I'll mention a couple of states that have really made, um, definitely really made gains uh, in this area in coming up with their own state electricity laws. The first one I have to mention is Imo State. Um, as I'm sure some of the viewers will know, Imo State has recently passed their electricity law. That means if you want to generate, distribute, transmission electricity in Imo State, you go to their state electricity board and no longer um, NERC. Um, uh, I'll 
definitely give credit to the governor, the state assembly for coming through so quickly, being the first state to do it. And we can already see that there are some benefits expected from this. Um, I'll quickly mention the industrial estates in Oweri. Um, there's been interest from independent power producers to um, set up power and build up uh, that. I know that the minister is working on that. Um, uh, and then I'll move to Lagos State. Lagos is the economic capital of the country um, and the largest, largest consumer of electricity. We have the highest um, amount of industry in the country concentrated in this state. So it is crucial that the state, the governor and the state assembly get this right, which they're currently doing. Um, from here, I'll head to the state assembly for the public hearing on the Lagos State Electricity Law or the bill that is being pushed through That's the state assembly. It's supposed to be assembly. domesticating it yes. for Lagos State. So how does this work as an independent power company? Um, so you generate, uh, do, do you check out for the source, do you do the green power mm. or just anyone? So as an independent power producer, um, currently we generate electricity, sell to our end users, um, independent of the grid. But with the... What's your source? Is it oh, solar? Is gas. Is it hydro? We use gas. Gas, okay. Um, so we, we haven't really tapped into solar yet, mm, but that's, um, that's in abundance. Uh, the, the issue with solar is that the capital cost of setting up, let's say, one megawatt of um, power generation is about three times higher solar compared to using gas um, turbines and generators. So there's a high capital cost. However, there are some incentives um, which need to reach people like us, companies like us. Um, uh, the uh, United Nations offer carbon credits. Uh, one of our projects is currently um, keyed up, is signed, uh, signed up to that. Um, uh, our projects we're doing in conjunction with MTN. Um, MTN is a multinational. They have access to, um, uh, to these areas. So it's something that if it spreads, if it can be spread to other independent power companies, there will be an incentive. The carbon credits, the way that they work is basically for reducing your emissions, you're given a uh, monetary benefit. Um, so it's basically to encourage uh, countries like us to try and reduce emissions. All right. Mm. So um, you produce the power, you have target customers, mm. you approach them, and then they buy into you. So you are the one who supplies them. Tell us how that mm. works. And the issue of cost, obviously, is, is, is a factor. Here. Yes. Um, so I'll, I'll say that the major factor affecting us um, and I'll say affecting the industry, um, is the cost of gas. So firstly, gas is priced in dollar. So anytime Naira moves against the dollar, our gas price um, goes up. Um, uh, most of our customers are, apart from the telecoms, most of our customers are industrialists, uh, factories, SMEs, the people that are producing, the people that um, employ the most Nigerians. So um, gas price, gas is produced in Nigeria. As the Minister of Power said, it should be priced in Naira. If it's priced in Naira, that helps us a lot. Um, I know another thing that has come up in the public hearing and the state law has been um, also the cost of gas. So we pay a lot more for gas as an independent producer, power producer, than the Jenkos do. If we can get a lower gas price, we'll be able to, you'll see a lot more investment. You'll see a lot more investment um, and people will have more access to power. Hmm. So this course say, uh, we keep talking about, is it uh, service reflective tariff yeah. or cost reflective tariff? Hmm. And they also complain of things like oil theft and then uh, customers not paying hmm. up. How do you handle that? Uh, we, I mean, it's a difficult issue, but um, I think the state law, uh, the Lagos state law anyway, is addressing all of these issues. So first of all, in the area of theft and um, illegal connections, the law will set up an enforcement unit that um, will have the power to enforce this, will have the power to um, prosecute 
um, offenders and so on. So that um, helps. And more importantly, the cost reflective tariff is enshrined in the, uh, in the bill. So uh, there won't be subsidies. The tariffs will be cost reflective. However, there's provision there for robust discussion between the suppliers, the producers, and the, um, uh, and the uh, end users. I believe in order to agree on a tariff that's cost reflective, um, you will have to have about 70, at least 75% of the residents in that area agree to, um, I believe it's about 75%, but um, uh, that can be confirmed. So we will see a cost reflective tariff. Um, some people may pay more for electricity, but it will be much more available. And if I can just give you a figure, in Nigeria, the whole of Nigeria, we spent 20 trillion naira on generating electricity. Only one trillion of that went to the grid. So that means Nigerians are spending 19 trillion to generate electricity themselves. In Lagos, we generate about 16,000 megawatts of electricity. That's four times the um, national average. Out of that 16,000, I think it's only 1,000 comes from the grid. So Nigerians are spending a lot of money generating electricity themselves. If that money, even just part of it, can be put back into um, uh, the grid, into investment, um, uh, Nigerians in total, on a you know, holistic basis, will be paying less for their electricity, even if their tariffs are increased slightly. Mm. So what you do as in, an independent power supply is you have a target or agreement with uh, companies, with communities, yes. so you target them yes. and they don't have to be connected to the national grid, they're just connected to you yeah. and then uh, they get there. So uh, right. you're, you're going for the hearing in Lagos now, yes. after that what next? Um, uh, after that, we're hoping the governor, um, the third reading, you'll pass the third reading, the governor will sign the bill into um, law. And for us and for everyone else, we're currently licensed by NERC, that's under the federal government. But us and every other power producer or trader in Lagos will have to be licensed with the new um, Lagos State Agency. So once the bill is signed into law, we move from federal um, to the state. So the state will then have complete control. Um, and one more thing to um, mention, uh, as, part of the, as part of the law, the system operator is going to be independent. So we hear about grid collapses, and whenever that happens, we look at the system operator. Um, in Lagos, once it has its own electricity market, it will have an independent system operator. Um, uh, that system operator will operate the markets, will be in charge of operating the market. The f um, state government will still regulate the market, but the system operator will be in charge of operating the market. Um, so I think that will also help a lot with um, improving service. Mm. All right, so I will certainly look for the days when we don't have to say um, mm. the greed has collapsed and yes. start counting and the costs and mm. all of that. But thank you so much. We wish you the best as you, you go for the hearing. Managing Director of Welbeck Electricity Independent Power. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. All right. Now, so uh, power, of course, uh, it's a major one for any business or any economy. Let's take a break now. When we come back, we do have another conversation waiting for you. The private sector is still in focus here on Business Morning on Sunrise Daily. <laughs> All right, uh, you're welcome back. And yes, of course, food security is still on the table. I'm so glad that yesterday uh, the lawmakers also are uh, talking about this, the need that, for, that attention is given to food security in the countries at the bottom of everything. But anyways, talking about the private sector now, the Africa Finance Corporation is interested in the private sector in Nigeria or in Africa, well, as the name implies. So we have, I want to delve into this with the Senior Director and Treasurer of AFC, uh, Banji Feintola is the Senior Director and Treasurer. But, uh, well, I guess I should be the first to say this from the first 
of August uh, is going to be the executive director and head of financial services with AFC. So, uh, good morning. Well, I, I guess I should say congratulations ahead of August. Well, good morning and um, thank you for for the congratulatory message. I appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. So, um, uh, AFC is interested in the private sector, private sector growth on the continent. Uh, Forgive me if I'm selfish and I'm talking more of Nigeria. And you're talking about emerging uh, markets. Uh, we just talked about power, which is an infrastructural deficit or a gap, has an infrastructural gap on the continent, beginning with Nigeria. But you are also concerned about access to markets. Uh, we see some countries have started using, for instance, the AFCFCA platform. But I don't think Nigeria has really started. What do you bring to the table as AFC to help emerging markets in this area? Well, I mean, I think a lot. And um, as you definitely know, AFC has been in operation for about uh, 16 plus years, since 2007. And during that time, we've done a lot in terms of intervention across several countries uh, on the continent. When we started, we were about $1.1 billion. Today, we're about $12.5 billion with 43 you know, African countries that have signed up to be members of AFC. We've deployed about $13 billion as well in about 36 countries. So that's really quite important for us, what we do in terms of scaling up developmental impact on the continent. And we've done a lot of that. We intend to do a lot more. Um, in the years to come. Uh, we primarily intervene through five sectors, you know, natural resources, which is oil, gas, and mining. We do power, which um, I was glad to see the previous session. We spent a lot of time talking about power and energy access. We do transport and logistics. You know, we do um, heavy industries, telecoms, and we also support financial institutions. So what you notice is all these sectors generally help us you know, to create decent markets for Africa. You talked about the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. We're very big in supporting that. We cannot connect Africa in terms of intra-African trade without supporting infrastructure, which is the backbone upon which um, trade will sit. So across all those, uh, we see tremendous opportunities and we are actively, you know, working across the continent, including Nigeria. Obviously, I notice your selfish interest about Nigeria, but we're actively working here as well to ensure that markets are more efficient and we can deliver the kind of development that will trickle down to the African population. Mm. But how do you suggest this issue of devaluation of uh, currencies, Naira included, be handled? Because uh, that obviously makes a lot, of, a lot of things difficult. I mean, thank God you listened to the conversation on power. They have to pay for gas in hard currency and of course with the devaluation of the naira or uh, it becomes more expensive so i mean devaluation of the currency is, is a huge problem for many countries on the continent at this time i fully agree with you and you know honestly that's been a problem that has been with us for decades right so if we go back to our parents time i'm sure they will be screaming to see where the currency is today compared to what it was during their time and even during our own lifetime growing up in this country. And it's just a reflection of the structure of our economies. Um, whenever there's a massive devaluation, that has impact on inflation. It has an impact on the cost of living of people. And that's largely because most of the things in this country and on the continent tend to be imported. So you tend to have more of imported inflation largely because currency is losing value from time to time. Now, that's extremely, you know, it's a big challenge that we need to address. And I think, for me, there are two things. One, what, let's focus on the first thing we can control. One thing we can control, obviously, is our taste, you know, and preferences for imported things, you know, as long as it's not capital goods. I'm just talking about consumables. That is within the control of people. Well, people will not buy local products except the quality is probably as good as what they get, you know, from the imported ones. So we know that we need to fix the value chain. You know, the whole process, you know, the system today where Africa has abundant natural resources, we ship out those natural resources, 
we don't do any beneficiation or processing on the continent, and then we import finished or semi-finished goods, that has to stop. And that's really where AFC has been very active in trying to ensure that there's more value capture on the continent. So we've been highly successful with this in Gabon, which I'm sure you might have heard about, where we've developed special economic zones. And the whole idea is that a lot of production needs to start happening on the continent. Our special economic zone today is in 10 countries. Obviously, Nigeria is also one of the countries in which they are also uh, starting activities. In Benin, cotton, you know, through our special economic zone, is now being processed into, you know, fabrics, into T-shirts, into towels, and those things are being exported to the rest of the world, bringing foreign currency into the country and the continent as well. So that's really the direction of travel. For us to address this problem of devaluation, Africa needs to move up the value chain. And moving up that value chain, therefore, means that we can export and add value on the continent and get hard currency which supports uh, our local currencies. Yeah, well, I really wish we could delve more on that, especially when you look at uh, workable, innovative business models. Uh, I wonder if you can do that in less than a minute. We're almost out of time that you can suggest this time for just Nigeria, <laughs> let me let my selfishness show. You know, we saw a lot of multinationals leaving the country. It's worrying. You know, but of course we can also make the most of it. What are some of those or what is one major uh, model you think Nigerians can adopt? So Nigeria specifically is blessed. And I mean, just Nigeria mirrors the rest of the continent. You know, over 60% of this continent uh, is people below age of 25. So we have a youthful population. We need to find a way to ensure that that population is engaged. We need to find a way to get jobs for those people. And that you know, links to my earlier comment around providing opportunities and moving up the value chain. Um, the government itself needs to create, obviously, a, a, a very friendly environment for businesses to thrive. Mm. I think the role of government in any society really is to remove the bottlenecks and let the private sector to just fly okay. and capital come institutions like ours needs to find a way to connect global capital also to Nigeria and to the rest of the continent. And you have our commitment that we'll be doing that significantly at AFC going forward. All right. So thank you. We'll hold you to your word. And we hope this capital will not cost us an arm and a leg. Mr. Banji Feitola, Senior Director and Treasurer at AFC, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much for having me. All right, well, unfortunately, we don't have time to do the markets, uh, but do join Laddie Williams and Anita Edet at 1 p.m. Business Incorporated. They'll give you all the market fresh numbers, so you don't want to miss it. And also, remember that NNPCL conversation is also waiting for you. Then let's head back to the Sunrise Daily Studio.